Thank you very much. Let me turn this thing on. Yay. So here's the book cover, but I also love this little cartoon in the Boston Post Sunday Magazine. Uh, this youngster has his newspaper cap on, just like a soldier. He carries a wooden rifle, and he totes a little uh, cannon toy behind him, and he is part of the home guard. He protects his home, his uh, bedroom, his mother's room, the kitchen, and everything else. During the Great War, 27 states established home defense organizations that ranged in name from state guard to home guard. With the exception of a handful of those states, these organizations consisted of unpaid volunteers who took over the functions of the National Guard that had been federalized for service overseas to fight the Germans in France. The Great War was the first major conflict where the National Guard was incorporated into the Army and served outside of the United States because the President and Congress needed them. Why did they need the National Guard? Because our regular army was only approximately 100,000 men. And our National Guard was approximately another 100,000 men. So that comes up to fully, full military strength for the United States being 200,000 men in a war where millions had already died. Okay. So by adding the National Guard to the regular army, they doubled in size, but really the only way they would make numerically a difference in World War I was by establishing the, the Selective Service Act, which established a draft, and then eventually it would rise to 1.5 million men. Now why did the President and Congress have the authority to send the National Guard overseas? because Congress passed two pieces of legislation. One was the Militia Act of 1903 that gave the President and Congress the authority to mobilize, federalize the National Guard and use it in overseas service. And then during uh, the preparation movement uh, of 1916, when more and more Americans became aware that we will be part of this war whether we like it or not, uh, Congress then passed what's called the National Defense Act of 1916, reinforcing the idea that the President and Congress can federalize the National Guard and send it into overseas service. But let's get back to the Home Guard itself. Where would, uh, where in the nation, where in the country, um, to take a, a larger view first, would be the most concern over why we need to replace the National Guard. The National Guard usually is out there protecting us during a national crisis, uh, during a national disaster, or um, the history of the National Guard is also when major labor unions go on strike and destroy property, then the National Guard usually was called in to return or maintain law and order, right? Um, but initially what people were concerned about is uh, the East Coast, that there would be a potential menace on the East Coast. Why on the East Coast? Well, what separates us from Europe, where the war is already raging, is the Atlantic Ocean. And what was swimming, not sailing, swimming in the Atlantic Ocean? German submarines, right? What was to keep them from uh, sailing into New York Harbor or into Boston Harbor and so on? So people wanted to make sure that when the National Guard leaves, somebody was out there to protect the American people should the, American, should the German uh, menace appear. And then on July the 30th, 19, whoops, so there's a submarine. On July the 30th, 1916, in the New York at the Black Tom, where did it go? Something just died. Okay, no problem. Uh, way up top in the, in the um, right hand corner, uh, this is the Black Tom Railroad Yard. An unexplained explosion happened. And who, of course, are the people blaming in 1916 as having done this? It must be the German enemy, right? Some kind of spy or somebody from the inside who is pro-German must have blown this up. So once the National Guard was called up, states like Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, and Wisconsin immediately established state guards to replace that departing National Guard. Uh, these states actually also passed legislation 
with their state legislatures to minimally fund these state guards uh, to, to allow them to purchase uniforms and rifles to protect their uh, areas. But states like Texas or Missouri did not do that. Our legislature had already gone home. Back then they didn't meet as long as they do nowadays, and back then they only met every other year. So our legislature had already left, our assembly had left before the United States um, declared war. So the governor at the time period, Frederick Gardner, did not see the need for the assembly to come back, so he didn't call them into special session. So that's why in Missouri, these are all volunteers. They would not get any wages or any appropriations. Um, in the South, there was really little concern. Uh, it didn't look like any submarines were sailing towards South Carolina or into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there, the concern was more if you establish a home guard and possibly African Americans might want to join them and thus train with a rifle, that that potentially could create a crisis, like uh, race riots or anything like that. So in the South, there was there were no governors who called for any home guards or state guards to replace the uh, departing National Guard. Instead, what they would do is add funding to local police forces, to sheriffs, and so on, in order to take on some of the duties of the departing National Guard. But there was one other concern. So that's a cotton country. One other concern, and that was the border with Mexico. Because in 1916, Pancho Villa had actually raided Columbus, New Mexico. So it's a Mexican renegade who, with his guys, went into New Mexico, killed American people, and Congress authorized a punitive expedition, including the use of the National Guard to go to the border, actually cross the border into Mexico, and pursue Pancho Villa. And the National Guard was down there for a good six to eight months, and some historians have said this was perfect training for what the National Guard would have to do in the future. So they knew how to handle um, uh, rifles, they knew how to work with the regulars, um, uh, so th this was uh, in ex uh, perfect uh, training, even though they didn't know that this would be the perfect training that they would be getting. Um, so along the Mexican border, the concerns remain, and it's not just because of Pancho Villa or the Mexican Revolution, or as you may have heard, the Zimmerman telegram that invited, uh, that the Germans uh, let it be known that Mexico would get support from Germany to regain territory that it had lost in the Mexican-American War uh, in 1848. But we also now know for sure that individuals from Germany and from Austria were actually financing Pancho Villa in raiding into the United States. So people who had that knowledge at the time period really seriously thought we need some kind of protecting force uh, in case, since the National Guard would be federalized. So moving from the larger picture to the smaller picture to Missouri. In Missouri, this is the governor at the time period, Frederick Gardner, uh, originally from Kentucky, but uh, moves to St. Louis and has a coffin uh, business and, and becomes governor in 1916. He really believed that there was a serious need for a replacement force for the National Guard. Why did he think that? Because he had a major problems at his hands at the beginning of us entering the war. In July of 1917, miners in St. Francis County went on strike. And this was not your everyday just walking around with a sign demonstrating and talking things up and so on. This was a violent strike. And the local sheriff could not maintain law and order. So he called the governor, and the governor sent in two companies from St. Louis, two National Guard companies from St. Louis, to go down to St. Francis County and reestablish law and order and maintain law and order. And the governor's thinking, wait a minute, I know the National Guard is leaving next month. What if we have another strike just like this? Who is going to be able to reinstate law and order? What if this gets larger? How can I keep my home front here in Missouri safe? the property of these mines safe, and so on. 
So um, that is one major factor why he thinks this is really necessary. But you may also know that Missouri has a pretty large German-American population, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and Frederick Gardner, he had, when he was running to become governor in uh, 1916, he had actually asked German-Americans to vote for him. But now he hears all these rumors about spy plots, about things being potentially blown up. <coughs> there was a rumor that the Frisco Railroad Bridge between, um, um, is it Lawrence County and, and Greene County down there in southwestern Missouri was supposed to be oops, blown up. And so he couldn't trust the German Americans that had actually voted for him, right? So he, he, he is kind of hesitant, and uh, so he needs to have a National Guard around uh, in order to make sure that these German-Americans behave properly, that they don't become uh, the enemy on, at home. So on July the 13th, Governor Gardner, by executive order, calls for the establishment of a Home Guard in Missouri. And in this order, he said, the need is immediate and vital. It is not a question of mere desirability. It is an imperative call for the protection of our homes. So he really saw this uh, as a serious need. And perhaps to his surprise, men volunteered left and right. And to what I've done here, oops, okay. Uh, I hope you can halfway see this right, uh, is a map uh, I've highlighted is uh, the areas where the German settlements are, or German American settlements are. And then in, in different colors, I have tried to identify where the individual companies and regiments of the Home Guard would be. There was nearly 10,000 Missourians, 10,000 Missouri men who over a span of 17 to 18 months joined this Home Guard. And this was really a dream or, or um, idea of the governor. He wanted the Home Guard to look like the National Guard, but at the same time, he also wanted the men to express the show me spirit through their volunteerism, okay? So um, uh, they would be learning the same things that the National Guard would be learning, including weekly drills, army regulations, chain of command, and so on. But the one difference would be they're all volunteers, and they would select their own officers. So they would elect among themselves their, their lieutenant, first lieutenant, sec second lieutenant, first lieutenant, captain, as well as uh, colonel. And a total we have is uh, five regiments. And let me make sure I got that right. We have two regiments in St. Louis, the first and the third. We have uh, what I outlined here in the green companies down here in southwest Missouri, the second regiment. Um, uh, we have another one up here in Kansas City. Northern Missouri was divided up into the fourth regiment. And then along the Missouri River, everything in red, those are companies that belonged to the fifth regiment uh, infantry uh, of the Missouri Home Guard. And why in those regions? The only reason that I can come up with is why that is the case is because that's where the National Guard companies were. Uh, St. Louis had the 1st Missouri Infantry National Guard. Uh, Southwest Missouri had the 2nd Missouri Infantry National Guard, so the 2nd Regiment of the Home Guard replaced them. Then in Kansas City, or in, as well as St. Joseph, there was the 3rd and the 4th Missouri Infantry National Guard. So, um, and then here in Southeast Missouri, where we only have independent battalions, not an entire regiment, um, you also had National Guard companies. That's the closest correlation that I can come up with, why in these particular areas we also have these Home Guards. Interestingly, it's not just white men who want to volunteer for this. Women also want to volunteer. They want to show their ability to defend their homes if their men are called up for service, if they're drafted, as well as if they go into the, the Home Guard. So we have efforts in St. Louis for a Home Guard company of women. 
I have not found any evidence that they actually had an organized company, but they received training. The 1st Regiment in St. Louis actually offered military training to women if they wanted to attend classes. They also learned how to fly a hot air balloon, how to decode uh, messages, so, um, and uh, one newspaper article actually talked about women drilling with rifles in the streets. But they're not defined as a home guard company, it's just women who get training through the 1st Regiment uh, who can do that. Now, in southwest Missouri, um, there is an actual company. Newspapers report about this company in Web City of women drilling out in public in the streets, taking long hikes into the woods and doing whatever female soldiers do in the woods. <laughs> and, so, um, uh, and then it, I also found tantalizing evidence that African American men wanted to join Home Guard companies, wanted to establish them. The first efforts were in St. Louis, but nobody was going to listen to them. Why? Everybody was afraid that there would be a repeat of the race riot in 1917. East St. Louis race riot in July of 1917. Everybody was afraid that that would happen again if there were black men who would be drilling in uniform with rifles. Interestingly, it is in southwest Missouri, of all places, that there is an actual so-called Negro Home Guard. Uh, that's what it was called. It's being advertised in the newspapers. They are drilling in a public park. Everybody can see them. Nothing is in opposition to them, which makes the race riot of 1916 in Springfield very interesting. If, if there is anti, if, if there's presence of racism, why would they also allow a so-called Negro Home Guards to exist in that area? I'm hypothesizing that it is a very patriotic region and that people actually overcame their racial differences in order to make sure that the home front is protected, okay? So um, uh, those, those are the areas where the home guard companies are actually established. Now St. Louis also had a troop of cavalry and an armored car mounted with a Lewis machine gun. This must have been quite a sight when they participated in the 4th of July parade. Not only do you see the men marching in their uniform and the cavalry being the men on, the, on their horses, but you also have that armored car coming down the road, right? So St. Louisans must have really felt truly protected by this home guard, okay? Oops. Here's an image of Company K from the Kansas City Home Guards. Any able-bodied man between the age of 18 and 50 could be volunteering, but they would also have to pass the rigorous physical fitness examinations in accordance with National Guard guidelines. But as you can possibly make out on this image, the third gentleman and the fourth gentleman from uh, your left uh, they look a little older than 50. And then way down on your right, you have the bugle boy who's much younger than 18. So anybody who wanted to join and uh, wanted to really serve in the Home Guard was usually taken and accepted. The oldest age that I could find was 77. And the person was marching, drilling, and everything else. <coughs> Many of the men who joined the Home Guard were also part of what was called the uniformed rank of fraternal organizations, such as the Knights of Pythias and the Woodmen of the World. But I also asked, now, why else would men want to serve in this Home Guard? Why would somebody want to do that? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, one is a sense of duty. So you have these patriotic advertisements, like this one in the uh, Evening Missourian from Columbia, that tells you that Uncle Sam expects you to do your duty by <coughs> support the Red Cross, support the YMCA, buy a Liberty Loan Bond, buy war saving stamps, and join the Home Guard if you're a man, right? Then you will be really 
patriotic and you will be trained and able to protect your state and your home should the need arise. But I also found this one. Cartoon in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch by our famous cartoonist, Mr. Fitzpatrick. And this looks like masculinity to me, this hypercharged masculinity during the era of uh, Teddy Roosevelt, be it as a rough rider or as a president of the United States, right? So many men at the time period really thought that they were weak because all they would do as a white collar employee would be sitting at a desk pushing around paper, not doing any physical work anymore, and now they can put on a uniform and they can do what is their manly duty, and that is protect their families and their homes as well as their state, okay? So, Teddy Roosevelt, I think that's him, comes with the club and Germany being represented through the spiked helmet here is ready to defend the home front. Well now, once the men joined, the first question that they had to ask is, what kind of uniform are we going to wear? We can't, technically, because of regulations, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> wear the same uniform as the army. So we need to have some kind of distinction. And the adjutant general issued orders that the uniforms would be khaki, just like the regular army. But every man would have a light blue brassard on the left sleeve. So that's clearly a distinction. Also, the headband on the hat was different. Rather than being gold in the regular army, it would be red, white, and blue to represent patriotism through your joining in, these, in this home guard, okay? Now the problem, the other problem is, once we figured out what uniforms to wear, how do we get our hands on these uniforms? <coughs> because we have volunteers. Who's gonna, the state is not giving us any money. Uh, the National Guard is gone, so all that money is gone. So how are we getting these uniforms? Well, you have to hold a bazaar or a bake sale or some kind of other fundraiser so that you can get raise enough money so you can buy those uniforms. And then a local, local clothing store would be ordering them. And these clothing stores would actually also sell similar suits to ordinary customers who are not part of the home guard. They would also sell boots or shoes that are similar to the shoes and boots that would come with the uniforms to their ordinary customers and thus make, a, make, make advertisements, uh, sales. Um, if it's good enough for the home guard, it's good enough for the ordinary customer, right? Um, there were no identifying insignias on the uniform for the ordinary uh, infantrymen, the ordinary private, only the NCOs and officers displayed their ranks. What set each state's uniform apart were their buttons. And this is a button actually created by one of the members of the 1st Regiment in uh, St. Louis, and very similar throughout the states that had state guards and home, home guards. So um, uh, you identify your state, MO, you identify home guard, you also identify the state, in this case Missouri through the two bears um, uh, that we have on our Missouri flag, and then you have the one in the middle, and that's the 1st Regiment. So this identified you as a member of the particular regiments and being in a particular state. And that was, would be distinguished throughout um, all the home guard companies. Here is a photo of the Yancey Mill home guard that's south of Rolla. And I don't know to what degree you can actually make this out, but you actually have not all uniforms being the same. Uh, for example, you can see different hats. Let me see. Where, where is he? Where is he? He's over there. Um, I think it's this person or next to him. Uh, he is actually of a uniform rank. He does not have the um, more pointed like hat. Over here you actually have a mail carrier and then you have three individuals who don't have a uniform at all. Having enough uniforms for all the men who wanted to volunteer was a major logistical problem throughout the 18 months that the Home Guard actually existed. So what did the Home Guard actually do? What was their point? 
The primary serve point for them, according to the Adjutant General and the Governor, was to provide military training, be it to protect the home front or provide military training for men who were of draftable age. Okay? The Adjutant General actually said that if you are a member of the Home Guard and you learn about the ins and outs of military life, that you would actually be promoted faster to non-commissioned ranks such as corporal and sergeant. And I guess that was a good selling point because lots of 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds volunteered and they got their training in the Home Guard. So it's the Potosi Home Guard drilling uh, in the streets. And what I actually found is that the Adjutant General maybe was not quite as right as he thought he might have been. What I did is use the military records that are available online through the Missouri State Archives and compared them with draft cards, the cards that the individuals had to um, fill out, as well as the muster rolls that are also available here um, through the, the Home Guard. So I could see who was drafted and where they wound up. If they became corporals, sergeants, and in what branch they would actually serve. What I did realize was that the majority of them wound up in certain branches, such as the Signal Corps, the Engineers, or the Quartermaster Corps. Most likely they learned during training in the Home Guard that those branches existed. And then once they were drafted, when they went to training, most of the Missourians went to Camp Funston, uh, which is now Fort Riley in Kansas, they could then use that knowledge to weasel themselves into these special branches, and if you're in the Quartermaster Corps, you're not fighting in the trenches. You're in the rear, right? So they use that knowledge to not get killed, right? So um, not everybody became a sergeant, but most of them wind up in these particular branches. Now, so you drill on a regular basis, you have evening classes where you are learning the ins and outs of the military life, and then during the summer months, you're really going out into the woods and you're gonna rough it. And the 1st and 3rd Regiment in particular in St. Louis went out into week-long encampments. So you line up in the morning, you get into the truck, you're driven down to a special camp that is being set up, in this, ca in this case, Camp Philly. Uh, Dwight Philly was the first person from <coughs> St. Louis who died in France. They named the camp after him. It is hot, it's July, it is August. And as one letter writer noted, he was proud of himself for not having fainted in the heat. And these are newspaper accounts, as you can see, they're really getting out there. They're marching, <coughs> they're, they're getting hot, they have to drink water. Here you actually see uh, the light blue brassards on their sleeves. That sets them apart from uh, the regular army. So they spent hours out there marching, camping, roughing it. And these camps became somewhat of an equalizer because a banker becomes a water boy. He's a private. A reporter also is a private who peels potatoes, right? So social class distinctions go away in these camps and the men are equal to each other. Of course, we again have to understand these are white men who are out there, so they don't consider them equal to women or equal to African American men. But for these middle class men, distinctions went away and everybody was a private and then you have a handful of captains, lieutenants, and colonels. So <clears throat> they do that, and uh, one of the companies actually conducted oops, this one, a raid on Clayton. Two o'clock in the morning, the bugles go off, and the sergeant will call them, come out, get dressed, and line up. And then they march several miles from Camp Philly into Clayton, wake up everybody, make sure there are no German spies throughout the city, capture the city, and then return back to Camp Philly and have absolutely no casualties whatsoever. <laughs> Wonder why. Um, <laughs> but I thought that was just plain hilarious. Um, and, and the Home Guard did what the National Guard would be doing, uh, is protecting the home front. So when rumors started spreading that foodstuffs might be poisoned 
by German saboteurs, what did they do? They protect all silos, all um, other um, buildings and so on where foodstuffs would be stored. The Home Guard, as I read, not the Home Guard, the National Guard, as I already indicated, um, also had the duty to maintain law and order during labor strikes, right? And in Kansas City in early, in February of 1918, it all begins innocently enough with a laundry worker strike. These are women who are laundry workers who say we need to earn more money, we need to be treated better. And the whole thing turns into a general strike, bringing Kansas City to a standstill. Well, that was okay until the mayor went out to dinner, and you have some of the strikers going rogue and throwing rocks through the window in the restaurant where the mayor is eating. <laughs> so what does the mayor do? I've had enough. He gets on the telephone. He calls the governor and says, I need some help. And the governor says, well, you've got a home guard in Kansas City, don't you? And the mayor says, yes. And the governor says, well, I'm going to activate them. So the home guard is being activated. They restore law and order. And tensions begin to decline. And because of this action of ending this major general strike, the Kansas City Home Guard will actually now be turned into a National Guard regiment, but with restrictions. They're only allowed to be activated in the state of Missouri. They are not allowed to go outside of Missouri. So we actually have one Home Guard regiment being turned into the 7th, uh, the 7th Infantry Regiment Missouri National Guard with service limited to Missouri. So these guys actually got paid when they were called out, whereas the rest of the Home Guard was not paid. Lucky them. Um, in Warrensburg, winter became uh, training. Uh, opportunity, survival skills, but at the same time also cut wood for families who had men who served in the military overseas. And there was an unintended outcome as well. Crime actually went down because who wants to loot anything while the Home Guard is drilling on the public streets in town? Right? This was totally unintentional. And here's an example that I found in, in Joplin. Somebody was trying to, well, he succeeded in taking the car driving off a block over from where the home guard was drilling. The car's owner saw the guy drive off, drive off and he ran to go get the home guard and the home guard caught up with the guy. Well, the cars were a little slower back then too. So that helped, but, <laughs> but uh, the unintentional outcome, the presence of the home guard actually reduces crime. The most somber task that the Home Guard had to undertake was provide last honors for fallen heroes, soldiers who had died overseas. They served as pallbearers, keeping watch over the casket, or providing full military honors during gravesite of services. So that was the more um, somber task that they had. As I already mentioned, there was a company of the so-called Negro Home Guard in Joplin. Uh, they... slides are on. Sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, <laughs> faster than my students. Anyway, <laughs> they usually just let me go on and laugh. Anyways, uh, they drilled at uh, Schieffer Decker Park uh, in downtown uh, Joplin. They had uniforms. And their primary task was to give a send-off to the drafted African-American men who went off to training camps. Um, the draft drafted everybody, whether you were white or black, and uh, it, the military was segregated, yes, but uh, the draft, to a certain degree, drafted everybody. Um, the one difference that I found uh, with these newspaper accounts were very detailed. They gave me names of the individuals who were part of this company. And while the white home guard was all white collar, these guys came primarily from the service industries like barbers, porters, and cooks. But it was an opportunity for them to just demonstrate their patriotism. They were even invited to a 4th of July parade. So you have the companies of the 2nd Regiment, white, leading, and then the Negro Home Guard following them. 
So they were out in public, they were totally accepted in, in the community, and they were able to uh, display their patriotism, even though the adjutant general would have preferred for them not to be out there in uniform. But the presence of the Negro Home Guard also became a political issue. Selden Spencer was a former judge who was running for U.S. Senate in 1918, and he wanted votes. He's also a member of the 1st Regiment in St. Louis, but he's also an advocate for African Americans having the opportunity to put on a uniform, protect their home front, their families, the state of Missouri, and it becomes a major political issue. He actually does get elected to the United States Senate. So uh, it's not the voters definitely who voted for him must have to a certain degree agreed with it or they would have not uh, supported him. But my last subject here today is the story of German Americans joining the Home Guard. German Americans were seen with suspicion Many of the German Americans, even though their families had arrived in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s in Missouri, were still speaking German on the streets, reading German newspapers like um, the Westliche Post, I forgot which one it was here in Jefferson City, um, uh, and they were doing German things like, how dare they drink beer on Sunday afternoon in a beer garden, right? Whereas most Americans uh, would not do that. And the story becomes interesting in neighboring Osage County. Very much a German county with cities like uh, Freiburg and uh, Westphalia. Westphalia actually still had the Volksblatt, which was a German language newspaper, but it was shut down by citizens in Osage County because it had expressed thoughts like the United States should not be involved in this war. Um, uh, so it was seen as being unpatriotic and thus was shut down. The problem during World War I was people in Osage County did not buy the amount of war saving stamps that they should be. Every state had a quota and then every state was divided into counties and every county had a quota for liberty bonds, war saving stamps, volunteers for the Red Cross and things like that. And Osage County actually had a slacker label. Right? <laughs> that they were not quite 100% <laughs> patriotic. So within this slacker context, it becomes some very um, interesting what happens in a small community. Where's my pointer? There it is. Up here, the little community of Chamoy, right along the railroad track and right along the Missouri River. When the United States declared war on Germany, men in this community came together and created an entirely new National Guard company. It was not an infantry company, it was a hospital company. So they would be medics who would be sent overseas once the National Guard was federalized. And two of these men would actually sacrifice their lives during the fighting uh, on the Western Front in, in Europe. And Chamoy is also the only community in Osage County to have a home guard. And that was Company M, 5th Inf Regiment Infantry, Missouri Home Guard. So we have in this community very strong patriotism. But about half of all the members in the home guard also trace their ancestry back to Germany. So um, uh, is it that they're patriotic? Or is it that they feel the need to look patriotic because they're German Americans, right? We don't know that. We don't know what, what happened in their hearts and minds. Uh, but we know what happened in July of 1918. Doesn't appear in newspapers, which again is an interesting story. But it appears in the papers of the, um, oh, I forgot the name of the collection. Missouri Council of Defense. Missouri Council of Defense was responsible for mobilizing the home front in Missouri during the war based on standard guidelines from Congress as well as the National Council of Defense. <clears throat> it all begins on July the 3rd when Frank Oitman, a private company in 5th Infantry Regiment, Missouri Home Guard, 
met a person named Evan Valitz, the son of a German-born minister at the local barber shop. Oitman asked Valtz whether he knew why his supervisor at the local bank, cashier Joseph Kuster, had not reported for drill duty. By now you're realizing each one of those is a German-American, right? Evan Valtz supposedly responded, quote, oh, to hell with the home guards, unquote. On the following day, as participants up for the 4th of July parade lined up, Home Guard members realized that Avan Valtz would be the marshal of the parade on behalf of the Boy Scouts of Chamoy. The Home Guard unit stepped out of the lineup and refused to <coughs> march in the same parade as Valtz. <coughs> to avoid a Home Guard, quote, mutiny on Main Street, 2nd Lieutenant Harry Steinmann, the officer in charge, approached Valtz and requested that he not participate in the parade. Valtz initially refused, but left after the manager of the parade urged him to do so. All things look out. Later that evening, Steinmann and Valtz met again, and during the heated argument regarding the events of that morning, Valtz allegedly stated angrily that no, quote, self-dubbed captain or self-dubbed lieutenant, unquote, had any authority over him thus again denigrating the home guard. The following day, Valtz lost his job in the bank and faced charges under the Espionage Act, which Congress has passed in 1917. Why? The way the Espionage Act passed by Congress in 1917 was interpreted is that if a person threatened a member of the military, then the person who threatened interfered with the military, which the act outlawed. And you could look upon the Home Guard as being a military company, right? A military organization. So when Valtz says these words to Steinmann, he then broke the Espionage Act. During the investigation that followed, it became apparent that Valtz had made insulting remarks about the Home Guard, the flag, and the war effort of previous times. On several occasions, he allegedly also refused to salute the American flag and allegedly said, to hell with the flag. Such expressions, expressions indicated to the investigators an evil intention and unfriendly feeling toward American military organizations. But no one had bothered to report him. He was the son of a local preacher. He was German-American, like the majority of the population in the community, okay? But it's only now that he gets charged for these disloyal remarks. But then it becomes attorneys are trying to, to get him um, to trial and everything else, but then judges decide, wait a minute, the Home Guard really is not the National Guard. The Home Guard is really not a military organization. Therefore, we cannot really charge but. Now that it becomes clear that he cannot be prosecuted under the Espionage Act, citizens took the law into their own hands and forced Valtz to kiss the flag. During the late evening hours of July 7, 1918, several young men in Chamoy forced Evan Valtz to salute and kiss the American flag. The incident soon turned into a serious brawl as supporters of Valtz appeared in the streets willing to defend his honor. The group of patriotic citizens grew as well and began to force several Valtz supporters to kiss the flag. Some of the pro-Germans then ran to get guns. At this point, <clears throat> Richard Garstang, the camp captain of Company M, received frantic phone calls urging him to step in and maintain law and order. But he could not act without the authorization of the mayor, who happened to be out of town. In desperation, he gathered a few guardsmen, approached the mob, and persuaded the crowd to disperse, thus avoiding a serious riot. Why am I talking about this event? Not only did the presence of the Home Guard avoid further violence, but it also reflects a decision by many American, German Americans to join the organization. While the majority of them most likely were patriotic Americans, 
Membership was also an opportunity to deflect attention from one's ancestry, which could be associated with the enemy. And for Erwin Walz, who made these anti-home guard, anti-American remarks, this was seriously an issue um, because it was German Americans who controlled his behavior, not Americans. Well, I guess technically most of the German Americans were Americans, but they're still there. Yeah. So in conclusion, why learn about the Home Guard during World War I? Their presence kept the home front in Missouri, in Missouri fairly quiet. The approximately 10,000 men who served in Missouri assured that German spy activities or sabotage were kept to a minimum because the presence of the Home Guard deterred such activities. The Home Guard provided training for potential draftable men and they could use that training to advance in ranks or serve in special units. It gave men who would not be drafted an opportunity to do their part in the war, but on the home front. While the men may not have earned headline news or more accolades, they were proud of their service and were dedicated to it. They believed they were doing something important, and for that they should receive recognition. And at times they stopped labor strikes or prevented them through their sheer presence. They brought the war home to the American people who were not directly impacted by the war fought thousands of miles away. The Home Guard through their public drills was the reminder over here of the war being fought over there. And for German Americans, membership in the Home Guard was the most obvious statement of loyalty to the United States. Thank you very much.